It is always good to be back at Deutsche Welle. Uh, this is the third participation of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Liberty at the Global Media uh, Forum. Myself, uh, I spent part of my professional career here at Deutsche Welle, and therefore I'm always very happy to be back uh, at this important institution. I would also like to thank the organizers and also congratulate uh, Deutsche Welle to its 60th birthday. I'm mentioning a birthday because also for Friedrich Naumann Foundation, this is an important year. We are celebrating also at this time our 50th anniversary uh, of our international work. And I'm saying this with hindsight because the first project of Friedrich Naumann Foundation was started 50 years ago in the wonderful country of Tunis, Tunisia, and uh, it was a program for training journalists. And uh, up to this very day, uh, working with journalists is an important part of our project work. And this is uh, because we believe uh, that journalism, uh, good journalism, is an important ingredient uh, of a free and democratic society. A free and democratic society uh, is the objective of the programs of our foundation. And uh, we will discuss about freedom also in our panel today, uh, when we were invited to join uh, the Global Media Forum, there was a long discussion what we as uh, the Foundation for Freedom, the Liberal Foundation could contribute. And uh, we decided to put it into a question. And our question is more economic freedom, more freedom for the media. We will try uh, to answer this question and uh, with me here uh, is a high-caliber panel, uh, and I would like to, at the outset, uh, introduce the people who are standing, sitting in front of you. I'd like to begin with, to my right, Marites Vituk, who is from the Philippines. She's an author and a journalist and editor-at-large of www.rappler.com and president of the Journalism for Nation Building Foundation. Amongst the many things she did, she was a Niemann Fellow at Harvard University and also took postgraduate studies in international relations at London School of Economics. To my left is Mr. Ayman Mana from Lebanon. He is the executive director of the Beirut-based Samir Kassir Foundation. The foundation, through its SKIS Center for Media and Cultural Freedom, monitors press and cultural freedom violations in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, and uh, provides support and legal assistance to journalists who are persecuted. Then, next to Marites, is our friend from Latin America, Eduardo Enriquez, uh, is from Nicaragua. He is uh, a seasoned journalist and uh, has been working for the last couple of years, since 1999, as the managing editor of La Prensa, which is the most important newspaper in this country. And then right of uh, Mr. Eduardo is Oleg Komenok from the Ukraine. He is a senior media advisor of Internet, Internews Network he has also a long experience in journalism, media education, in managing investigative reporting and media support projects uh, in the post-Soviet media environment. Uh, he's worked as a reporter and editor, and I, as I was told, as he told us, uh, he is persona non grata uh, in two of these countries. And lastly, but not least, uh, with us is uh, to my left, Mr. Ali Salman from Pakistan. Uh, he's the founder and director of the Policy Research Institute of Market Economy in Islamabad. He writes a column uh, in a, an important Pakistani English newspaper called Express Tribune, which is called No Free Lunch. And he says of himself, and this already brings us a little into the direction of what we would do, that he is a libertarian. So he has a clear understanding of how he wants the economy to be managed or not. Um, as to the procedures, we have defined the questions we want to tackle uh, also in uh, the brochure. Uh, I will present them to you one more time. Uh, we will first 
tried to reach an agreement what constitutes a free press. Uh, we will try to define benchmarks for this in an international context. We will speak about the challenges uh, to a free media system and the role of the market uh, in this context. And uh, we will, of course, then uh, necessarily speak about regulatory systems, successful regulatory systems, democratic and liberal regulatory systems. And finally, we will discuss uh, the possible correlations between economic freedom on the one hand and political freedom on the other hand, and uh, thus also media freedom, and uh, answer the question whether it is true that economically free societies have freer media uh, than others. What we will do is uh, we will not have big presentations. We are trying to have a lively debate here with short inputs. Uh, it is my intention that uh, we discuss here amongst us for a maximum of 60 minutes. Uh, and then we would like to open also uh, the discussion to the floor. So if you have questions, uh, then please uh, note them down. And then uh, I will give you the floor when time has come. You know that uh, we are in a, an environment where a lot of uh, tweeting and usage of social media is taking place. And of course, we welcome you also uh, to use uh, these social media in this context. And the hashtag for this event is uh, hashtag WS38. So uh, without further ado, uh, I will start asking Mrs. Marie Tess uh, about uh, a free media, maybe in a nutshell, from a Philippine perspective, what constitutes a free media? Good afternoon to everyone. Um, I would propose two basic criteria for a free press because these are easy, easy to measure. Number one is the absence of state censorship. That means that there are no licenses on newspapers or internet news websites. And there, is no, uh, there are no guidelines from the state on how news organizations should operate in terms of presenting their news. The second basic criterion is that the absence of violence against journalists. Uh, in my country, a, a number of journalists have been killed, uh, but that's a different story, although there should be, there should be a basic criterion that no journalist should be killed in line of duty that the political and judicial environment should not encourage the violation of, of the rule of law and um, should not allow people to get away with murder, literally. The third criterion is a bit tricky because it's difficult to measure, and I propose that media to be free should be independent, that they should not be beholden to any vested interest, including their owners, advertisers, they should be independent even from the subjects that they cover. So these to me are the most basic uh, criteria for a, a free press. And are they uh, realized in your country? Two out of three, maybe. Uh, the conditions of journalists, those who are killed, come from the provinces where there are existing warlords. The Philippines is quite oligarchic, and there are certain provinces which are held a fiefdoms of very powerful politicians and businessmen. So when the small community journalists from community papers are critical of the powerful people in that area, then they, some of them get killed. But there's another story, which is the economic conditions of journalists in these areas is very poor. They are not paid well, so they are led to Inter conflict of interest situations. They get public relations jobs, they do PR work for politicians, unions, and they get caught in the crossfire. So some of them are killed not because of what they write, but because of they are led into this by the economic conditions. Eduardo, looking at Nicaragua and your own newspaper, La Prensa is a newspaper well known also beyond the shores of your country. Are these also the criteria you would mention? No censorship, absence of violence and independence, or would you add something to this? Well, yes, I have to agree with, uh, with those criteria, but I would add that uh, um, to have, you have to have diversity, uh, to have free press, because we have to think of the press as, as a public service, uh, not only as a, as a business, as, as, as some uh, companies uh, to make money, 
for the uh, owners. Uh, the press is, is also, although held, uh, held privately, uh, it has a social and public interest. So we do need diversity uh, to have a, a free press. We also need to have, uh, in, in order to satisfy this, uh, this demand, we, we need to have quality uh, journalism. Uh, we, we, we need to have better prepared journalism, journalists and uh, more uh, deep uh, journalism when, when, we're, when we're going to uh, tackle certain, uh, certain issues. Uh, so I will say those are part of, the, of, of, uh, of a free media and ac also access to information. That's a very important point for me, uh, coming from a country where access to public information, although we have a law uh, that's uh, called the free freedom of information uh, uh, law. Uh, this one is not used by the government. It uh, has been put aside, and access for in to information is very important because our mission is to take the information. Part of our mission is to take uh, information from the government and give it to the people. I suggest that we, we discuss how you can safeguard these uh, these principles and how you can promote them later on if we discuss the regulations, but. Uh, if you look at Nicaragua now and maybe the neighboring countries, are these, uh, are these uh, aspects respected? Do you have free media back home? No, I wouldn't say. Uh, that, that, that's a tricky question for me because uh, when people ask me, can you say anything about uh, in Nicaragua? Can you, can you inform about anything? Can you say any, anything you want? Uh, La Prensa can say it. Uh, but uh, it's probably the only newspaper that's doing it right now because uh, the, the government in Nicaragua, what has done is has bought uh, the, the other uh, newspapers, has bought uh, all, almost all the TV stations. So uh, there is no independence, uh, no independent outlets as Mary uh, uh, and there is not that, no diversity. We are probably the only uh, medium that uh, is informing uh, independently and uh, to me, that's not freedom of the press because, as I said, there has to be diversity. We see the, 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 the story or we see an issue in a certain way, but uh, the people should benefit from other points of view, too. So here we have the aspect of economic power, how it impacts diversity of the media. Again, a big question which is, is, is on the list of things we could discuss. Um, Mr. Oleg, coming from Eastern Europe and Ukraine. Uh, we have listed uh, some criteria. Uh, uh, Eduardo I added diversity and access to information. Do you have anything from your side, or do you, would you agree from your Ukrainian perspective? Yeah, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you, Ronald. Uh, yeah, I would add uh, probably uh, part of economical angle to, uh, to this discussion. I think that uh, to uh, evaluate and to measure the free press it's important uh, to uh, keep in mind uh, uh, how easy it is to enter the market uh, and uh, the economical conditions, uh, including the uh, corruption perception index or the uh, corruption development uh, in, uh, in the country. Because in Ukraine, the level of corruption is extremely high and the press is part of the society and the uh, press is affected by corruption in the same way. The reporters are bribed by, by the sources, by the politicians to cover or not to cover some uh, stories and uh, uh, there is a word that uh, uh, nothing costs uh, uh, so expensive uh, like something that is not published. So, uh, is the corruption also due to the low salaries the journalists are receiving or what's uh, the source of? To some extent, yes. Uh, this is uh, uh, as well uh, because of the level of the salaries. Uh, uh, what, what I would add as well, uh, to evaluate the freedom of the press, also important to keep in mind uh, the existence and uh, 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 effective uh, work of the self-regulatory uh, regulatory bodies uh, of the journalists. Because uh, government or courts uh, can do a lot uh, uh, a lot of stuff that might harm press and uh, harm the freedom of the press. But the self-regulation uh, would help uh, the people uh, to get uh, objective information, balanced information, professional information, and in case of uh, uh, the trouble, uh, the press would consider this within the society, within the professional society, based on the journalism standards as, as uh, uh, as Enrique told, uh, that uh, uh, 
the journalism standards should be uh, performed and ensured in the freedom in the in free press. Uh, I can I can do it forever, so <laughs> I would rather pass. The so point. the journalistic standards uh, should be held up, um, and uh, I mean this is a big challenge, uh, and certainly one of uh, the methodologies of it is training journalists and. Uh, we had a lot of input also from Deutsche Welle Academy and other, other institutes who are doing exactly this. Uh, how is this uh, handled in the Ukraine uh, to, to increase uh, the quality of the journalistic product? I mean, you yourself are involved in training journalists. Uh, are there also government-sponsored programs? Do you have a broad, uh, broad uh, well, there, is, there, is, there is a huge gap between the uh, traditional education, higher education for journalists uh, and uh, the practice. And uh, there are only, uh, I would count, two uh, universities in Ukraine uh, that are uh, doing their journalism courses on the high professional uh, standards, uh, basing their curricula on European or American uh, courses. And uh, uh, they have... Uh, in their curricula courses on new media, on uh, convergent newsrooms, and all these uh, new trends that uh, are uh, challenging media, challenging traditional media. Uh, but if I ask you personally now, you as a seasoned, yeah. uh, how did you get your journalistic training? I, for my part, as I said before, after finishing my studies, uh, with actually with a PhD at the age of 28, I came to Deutsche Welle for a so-called volontariat, and I learned uh, training on the job for 18 months, how to produce a radio program, how to produce a television program. I was introduced into the ethics of journalism and, and many other things uh, which, 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 which make out in a professional journalist. Do you have the same thing in your... Yeah, I, I have a degree in history, and uh, after graduated... I started to work in the paper and soon uh, to the uh, news agency. And uh, um, my textbook was the AP uh, style book and uh, the guidance for the reporters that was translated into Russian. And uh, it was probably the only book that uh, helped me to, uh, to develop my career in journalism uh, because uh, it was the uh, time when the Soviet Union declined and the only stuff in journalism uh, that I could get in the libraries was how to promote the Communist uh, Party and uh, how to write about the leaders. So that was before, before I turn to, to our friends on this side, uh, as we have uh, Eduardo here, who is a very senior uh, editor in his newspaper, yourself, uh, how did you get your training and now you are a managing editor and how do you train also your newcomers and the young folks? Well, I, I was lucky because I, I, I had the opportunity to travel to the United States and I got my degree I in English. journalism in the United States and learned a little English <laughs> there. Uh, and, uh, and, but I, I also have been uh, uh, lucky to, 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 to be uh, supportive. The, the La Prensa supports a lot of, a lot of, uh, of our uh, uh, preparation, you know. Um, I went to Barcelona uh, to study for nine months too, and, oh, yeah. and La Prensa supported us with that. And I'm not the, on, the only case. You know, there are about 20 uh, journalists in, in our newsroom that have uh, uh, enjoyed that benefit. Good. Let me summarize. So, with the criteria we stated so far for free press is no censorship, no violence towards journalists. It, the press should be independent. It should be diverse. Uh, access to information should be given and it should be easy to enter the market. And with this, I'm turning now to Mr. Ali Salman, because you're working as a freelance columnist uh, for a new newspaper, uh, and uh, obviously this paper entered the market. Uh, can you tell us how it is access to the market for startup media companies in Pakistan? Um, I think, first of all, we have to go back to the, uh, where there was uh, the media space was absolutely controlled by the state. And it was about you know, 12 or 13 years ago where the complete media space was, uh, was controlled by the state. Uh, electronic media, though the print media was still um, relatively uh, free from government intervention. And I like to problematize the word of vested interest a bit here, because I think when we, when we invite the private media uh, and when we expect the private media owners to enter to the market, they would come with a profit motive. 
and that is the that is the key to survival i mean unlike the state funded agencies uh, or or the channels which can survive uh, you know without actually thinking about the outcomes of their actions a private media industry has to uh, be very sensitive about the profit motives and we should appreciate that and rather than uh, bracketing with uh, the uh, with, with with the profit motive with the particular interest i think we should consider as a largely open competition um is the environment which is which is creation of um, which is an important condition but this pertains to 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 not only the media all the markets should be open for competition the fair market is always open yeah fair market okay. i mean i would i would actually extend the argument to even inclusion and openness of uh, to the foreign media this is something which is still de very debatable in our countries in pakistan it is uh, for instance uh, foreign media houses uh, and like many other countries are not allowed uh, to broadcast um and uh, this actually uh, you know limits uh, the the freedom which the press media or the electronic media has to an influence which it can make on the opinion formation so but this now this express tribune the newspaper you were talking about which is in alliance with the international herald tribune which we all know is is in alliance with the which is a sister company of the new york times which is uh, considered to be the best newspaper in the world do they have problems with pakistan do they have problems getting licenses there and and, and putting up store the the foreign media houses uh, can only operate in partnership with local companies they cannot come and operate um, as an independent entity so that's why um, this 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 new newspaper which is owned by a business group it is not a traditional media group it it has interest in in uh, uh, for instance tobacco industry and they entered into the media and of course this is being used now also they are into electronic media this is also being used as sort of a political um, instrument but this particular newspaper has uh, raised the standards of english language journalism in in, in pakistan quite considerably well in in the last few years i don't think the collaboration with the international media has helped a lot in that respect so from the criteria we mentioned here um are they all valid in pakistan um, or like censorship and violence and independence are these issues you are dealing with also yeah pakistan has been on the you know one of the top countries which has been re you know affected by the uh, the violence on uh, how does that happen journalism. i mean uh, marites explained to us i was living for four years in the philippines and and, and we saw this incredible yeah. uh, killing of journalists particularly on the local level and it's shocking of course but in pakistan uh, what is the background to to these murders there uh there have been murders of journalists who have uncovered stories about for instance um, involvement of army in undercover operations there have been numerous murders of the the journalists who have been following the terrorist or the jihadi elements and they, you know it is well known and is very well widely reported so it is it is there but i would like to add one more factor which is which is not very which is not very black and white in terms of, in terms of law which is the presence of an ideological state the the uh, the overwhelming influence of an ideological state uh, does not translate into you know a legal restriction on freedom of permission but there is a certain unsaid rules which are there and so this puts you know enormous pressure on the journalist not to write uh, even on political and socially sensitive and relevant themes so that's that's there as a challenge but i mean if there's a difference between putting pressure which leads to self censorship and to executing and killing journalists with targeting killings okay uh ayman uh, from uh, uh from uh, lebanon and uh, from the middle east uh, where i work in for some years now you say that you are active in giving legal assistance to persecuted journalists where are journalists persecuted they are somehow persecuted in the whole region in different ways and means of course um many of the cases we're currently dealing with when it comes to persecuted journalists granted legal assistance are uh, located in Palestine both in uh Gaza and the West Bank unfortunately the political divide between Fatah and Hamas has translated into using journalists as um mailboxes in a way to send messages to the political opponent 
So a journalist who is working for a media outlet considered closer to one camp has much higher risk and probability of finding himself or herself sued by one of the two cabinets or governments for, governments for a different reason. Usually it's libel, slander, defamation, but in a very targeted and consistent way. Many journalists who are arrested and questioned by the Israeli forces in the West Bank, when they are released, they find themselves again questioned and interrogated by the Palestinian Authority police to understand what happened inside the Israeli jails, what happened during the investigation, and it creates a level of pressure on them that is very often unbearable, and they receive assistance. How do you give them resistance? I mean, you are we in have, Beirut. There's no communication between you There and is you. communication. We have constant communication with our staff in Ramallah and in Gaza. That's oh, yeah, perfectly so you have a staff there also? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We have also staff in Jerusalem because we're also covering the, the freedom of expression, artistic and uh, media expression of Arab journalists inside the, the 1948 territories. And uh, specifically here, uh, we have uh, legal fir law firms who represent them. The situation in Jordan is actually one of the most interesting ones because in terms of number of exactions or violations that we count, it's very low. But the level of self-censorship in Jordan is just unbelievable. The, the interference of security services, secret services, and the appointment of the heads, managing editors of newspapers and media outlets is huge. You have at least two or three different managing editors every year in the major Jordanian newspapers. We never know how they appear and how or why they disappear. In Lebanon, the situation is again different because in Lebanon it's maybe one of the most diverse media environment. Violations are mainly about non-state actors physically assaulting reporters, photographers when they are on the ground covering demonstrations or activities without absolutely any single measure from the government. Can you be more precise? What is non-state actors? Non-state uh, actors can range from uh, armed uh, political party or armed political factions such as Hezbollah to a perfectly valid uh, or officially member of the liberal international political party such as the Future Movement whose members during demonstrations on the ground are very happy to physically assault a journalist just because he or she are, is working for a media outlet considered from the other camp. The cases are unbelievably high. We counted more than 51 cases in 2011, 38 cases in 2012. Even a journalist, a photographer, sorry, a cameraman killed on the Lebanese-Syrian border without the government or the police or the judiciary taking not even the beginning of an action to hold the perpetrators accountable. If you say you provide support and give legal assistance to persecuted journalists, uh, we have seen now uh, what is the background to this. Do you have any story of success where you have indeed managed to, to help uh, one of the colleagues who, who, who you somehow, who you are assisting? Uh, we have been following the case of uh, uh, Palestinian journalists, for example, in the West Bank, who uh, was questioned and summoned for questioning like every week. It's, it's become a kind of uh, uh, habit for him to go on Monday or Tuesday morning, I don't necessarily remember when, for questioning. And it was deeply linked to the fact that his family are somehow connected to Hamas while he's working in the West Bank. So after many cases, uh, many weeks spent in jail without any judgment, just under investigation, our lawyer eventually managed to get him freed on bail and where he will still be prosecuted but um, freely. Uh, we also worked on the case of a Jordanian poet a few uh, years ago who was uh, uh, prosecuted for um, uh, des desecrating Islam um, his case has also been somehow solved. It's not related to media freedom directly, but it's part also of freedom of expression. Uh, maybe we should give you the chance to say a little about Samir Kassir. He is an important figure for, for journalism in Lebanon, but he's not that famous beyond the shores of this great country. Please maybe you tell us who Samir he is. Samir Kassir is a journalist who was born in 1960. Um, 
uh, who also studied and wrote in France before coming back to Lebanon. Uh, during, until 2005, Lebanon was under huge political influence from the Syrian regime. Some people call it occupation, other people call it presence. And the Syrian regime at the time was extremely influential in, the cho in choosing the leadership in Lebanon in defining very strict rules of what is allowed to be said in public and what's not. Samir Qasir was one of the freest pens in Lebanon who never shied away from calling things what they are without any, uh, uh, without any fear. And he kept doing so and inspired so many uh, young intellectuals uh, to speak up the truth. And he was assassinated on the 2nd of June, 2005. After his assassination, the European Union created the Samir Qasir Award for Freedom of the Press which is today in its eighth edition and becoming one of the most prestigious press freedom awards in the Arab world. And his family and friend created the Samir Qasir Foundation to deal with the two things that he cared about the most. Freedom of the press and freedom of culture on the one hand and access to culture for all. Because these two things, although separate, are very deeply linked. Only a society that is open to different cultures, that is tolerant to artistic expressions and cultural expressions, can provide the real framework for a free press and free media. And we are very proud at Friedrich Naumann Foundation to cooperate with you, to have you amongst our partners. Thank you. I am now tempted, and I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will use this opportunity to be the moderator to to stick with Ayman for a moment, and please indulge with me because. There's been a lot of talk about, uh, we actually had a panel two years ago here about the so-called Arab Spring, and we had bloggers here, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, our foreign minister, a couple of hours ago, he would not use this word. He talked of Arab seasons. I think that was a diplomatic way of avoiding the word autumn. Uh, but uh, now I would like to ask Ayman, I mean, you said you're dealing mainly with the Mashrek countries, but of course you follow what's happening in Tunisia and in Egypt, and you know what's going on in other countries. A very short uh, uh, estimation, a very short comment on how media freedom uh, has developed uh, since, uh, since the uprisings or the revolutions. I will somehow... Uh avoid answering the first part of your question, or actually, I want to talk about Syria. There is absolutely no way to talk about journalism freedom without a quick mention to Syria, which is today the most dangerous place on earth for journalists, by far. We are talking about, if we add up journalists, professional journalists, both Syrians and internationals, as well as citizen journalists, bloggers, photographers, we have exceeded the number of 130 people who lost their lives uh, since the beginning of the revolution, not to mention the huge number of journalists who are abducted, arrested in Syria, including a German journalist, Armin Wertz, who was arrested in Syria a few weeks ago, and after uh, actually sending a message that he was arrested, he completely disappeared, and now there is absolutely no news about him. So this is also a call that in Germany uh, of solidarity with Armin Wertz and all other journalists who are abducted and uh, detained in Syria. The situation in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia is very particular because on the one hand, there is a rise in the number of new media outlets. There is a strong push for diversity, for new ideas, if we take, for example, just a small example, such as the Samir Qasir Award uh, number of candidates coming from these countries doing unbelievably amazing investigative stories about corruption, about how uh, governments, both before and after the, the revolutions, are attacking people's basic rights, we really feel that there are real seeds for new, a new generation of free journalists. Out of the 10 finalists, eight were under 30. Six were young women. This is a very positive sign. But at the same time, it's like the case where the police in Germany or in France has new techniques to catch uh, people who um, exceed speed limits. If we have higher numbers of violations, it does not necessarily mean that there, uh, there are less freedoms. Now there, are, there is a bigger diversity, which in turn is leading to more exactions, which in turn is leading to journalists being even more courageous to denounce more violations. So if we look at the th situation from a purely quantitative point of view, we might think that there is a regression in the situation of press freedom. However, the real situation is there are more 
accounted for and more revealed violations today, but there are at the same time freer media, more media and more courageous journalists. Thank you very much and also uh, thank you also for mentioning uh, the tragedy which is evolving in Syria and also the many journalists killed there and doing their work. Thank you very much, Ayman. I want to now move to the next question and start discussing a little the economics of the whole thing. And uh, Marites, uh, when she started her statement, she said that uh, for her the no censorship issue is important, the absence of violence, we all agree that is essential, but also that the media should be independent. Now, independent is uh, obviously also an economic term. Uh, and looking to the Philippines, uh, are the media economically independent? Or what does it mean to be economically independent? Is independence not uh, something which is actually not existing in reality? Well, I think a basic requirement for independent media is for the media owners not to own the ideal in the ideal world is not to own other business interests. They should be solely into media. Because if they, like in Pakistan, I think, and in the Philippines, um, some of the media owners are into big businesses like property, development, banking, shipping. So they use the media to protect their business interests. So I think this is not a sign of independent media. However, having said that, we have a certain amount of diversity in the in Philippine media because of the internet, and there are now smaller news organizations uh, starting. They're based in the provinces, in the cities, and they use the web because nobody owns the internet. So it's encouraging independent media. But now you said you don't like the idea of the so-called cross-ownership, that you have... Uh uh, a publisher who is also involved in public housing projects or the like. How is it in the Philippines? Uh, do you have this cross-ownership there? We do. We do. The largest TV network in the country, the owners of the largest TV network uh, are into uh, uh, energy and, um, well, they sold their interests in um, banking, but they use, they're now into energy. And you feel this in their reporting and then their commenting? Well, at, there's a lot of pressure now. There's, there's a very active, uh, there are active media watchdogs in the Philippines. There's a lot of pressure on these media companies to uh, follow one rule, which is disclosure. Always disclose in the reports that you know, this, uh, we are owned by a media company which owns this energy company whenever they write about uh, stories on this issue. So disclosure is number one because we can't change the system overnight. And they do it? They stick they to it? They do. Uh, some don't, but there's already a growing awareness of the need to disclose. That's always the number one rule. Eduardo, who owns your paper? Uh, it's a family-owned paper. The Chamorro family has owned it since uh, it's an 87-year-old paper, and uh, it's been owned by the Chamorro family, uh, solely by the Chamorro family for the last 82 years. Um, I don't have... Uh, much of a problem with uh, uh, cross ownership as long as there is diversity. Because if, 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 if one medium wants to uh, uh, advance its interest in, in other uh, industries and using, using the, his medium or its medium, uh, it's not doing itself a favor. Uh, while there is diversity, then people are going to look the other way and they're, they're, they're going to start uh, looking for other alternatives. So I don't, I don't see much of a problem uh, with, with that. I, what I is, am, what, can you define diversity? I'm sorry? When does diversity uh, start and where is it problematic? Well, if you only have... Uh, uh, th th that's what I was going to... Uh, my, next, uh, my, next, my next point. Uh, my, my bigger problem is with uh, market concentration. If you have uh, one uh, own owner that owns uh, television stations, newspapers, uh, radio stations, and then all the other ones are the little ones uh, and don't have too much reach, then you have, uh, I think you have a problem with that. Uh, diversity should be uh, different uh, outlets, uh, more or less uh, strong, similarly strong, and uh, also access of, of, to information, as I said, as I said before. But uh, as I said, uh, I don't think, I think uh, the owners of other um, industries 
have to think twice before they use their medium to advance their interests because they're gonna they're just gonna lose money no the people are not fools they are not fooled easily you have this diversity in, in, in Nicaragua no but uh, the the lack of diversity now comes from uh, the, the government and not I, I wouldn't say the government because that that, that would be the wrong idea it w most of our uh, media is not owned by the government is owned by the family uh, of the president, which is different. They are privately owned, but by the family of the president or uh, his associate, who is, who is not even a Nicaraguan. And uh, they own uh, uh, together about uh, 10 or 12 uh, TV channels that in, in open TV. Uh, so uh, I think that's where the real problem is. Uh, you go to Nicaragua now and you will not find a serious uh, newscast uh, on TV. That's, and that's and what happens if the president changes? <laughs> I, I, he doesn't foresee a change okay. in the near oh, future. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. But so, to answer your please. question, is yes, there's going to be a problem for uh, for democracy and for freedom uh, if he changes to the same problem we have now? Oleg, do you have diversity in Ukrainian media? Well, yeah, there is a diversity, but uh, there are several. Uh, other factors that are affecting the freedom of the press. First is the transparency of the ownership. Uh, most of TV channels on the national level in Ukraine are owned by the people who uh, have uh, cross ownership. They are involved in financial sector, in heavy industry, but at the same time, officially, these companies are established by offshore companies that uh, is an easy way to hide the real ownership. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's the, uh, it also, uh, uh, another, another factor is that uh, so-called uh, uh, corrupted uh, way of media business. Uh, almost all of these companies are not uh, profitable. This is uh, the media business where the investor uh, pumps the money in to uh, affect the uh, uh, public opinion to go to the office and then uh, find a way to reimburse the money uh, spent for the media through the other ways. Uh, mostly this is corruption. You always use the word corruption. Is, is Ukraine more corrupt than other countries? Uh, I think that uh, all the people are uh, the same. But uh, Hey, wait. Others were not using corruption. They were talking about uh, other forms of impediments. I mean... Okay, maybe it's better to be corrupt than to be killed, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, is, you, are, is Ukraine very low or very high on this transparency international scale? Are you aware it's, of that? Uh, it's uh, it, uh, it's uh, in a very bad position oh, yeah. in the transparency international. Oh, yeah. Well, and uh, uh, another factor that I think from the economical point of view is the uh, control of the government over the economy. Uh, that's, uh, it's, uh, it's probably... Uh, Growing now in uh, uh, Ukraine, it depends not only by the government, but by the uh, oligarchs or the uh, political groups that are in power. But the colleague of mine from Belarus who is sitting here would uh, correct me that uh, in Belarus, about 80% or even more of economy is controlled by one person, by state uh, in face of uh, Lukashenko, in the, of the president of Belarus. And this affects uh, uh, the absence of the competition on the market. And this uh, causes the absence of the uh, real advertising market, the uh, uh, base for the profitable and professional uh, media. Uh, the, si the system where there is no freedom uh, on the market, there is no competition, that everybody is controlled by one group or one person, creates the situation when the media can't be sustainable no matter how professional would be reporters and uh, uh, no matter how professional uh, would be the uh, editors and uh, how good would be the uh, expectations of the people. Thank you. Disclosure and uh, diversity, cross ownership. Do you have a comment from the Pakistani side? I don't have a problem as far as the cross ownership is concerned. I think, uh, as Edward was saying, uh, this is not the, the issue. The issue is whether there is enough uh, freedom of expression and enough competition within the industry 
to uh, to survive. Um, so I would not like to, I think, further add on this. Probably we can uh, continue the other points here. Good. From your side, do you have this issue also of big business people owning media and therefore corrupting the political process by? Actually, biz big business people are also big ministers and big political party leaders at the same time, and they own banks, and they own political parties, own political parties, and they own media at the same time. However, the, again, as long as there is access to the market, this can be mitigated, the problem can be mitigated. And we see that the people who are controlling these uh, traditional medias are not necessarily always understanding the changes that are happening in the world. You have a policy where private people who own newspapers actually own the license to have a newspaper. And they voted for themselves such a legislation back in the 50s. So if any person today wants to open a new newspaper in Lebanon, for example, he has to go and buy one of the existing licenses. But they didn't realize that there is something that starts with www dot, which are becoming much more um, popular than newspapers. The largest newspaper in Lebanon, I doubt that it prints more than 30,000 copies per day. However, the major websites, news websites in the country, have this number reached within a few hours and not only within one day. Same thing for televisions. The big political parties representing the various religions in Lebanon controlled the analog TV market in 1994. They divided it into eight shares and got it. But this law does not apply to digital, and now there are so many newcomers to the scene uh, using satellite and cable. So this is why this attempt to control the market, given the new technologies, is becoming archaic and shows an archaic mindset related to media and related to politics. So therefore you would say technology is driving uh, free media? Technology is definitely a helping factor in free media, yes. Right. Because technology, not only does it open the way for new uh, players, but it also allows us to be creative also in terms of how to fund new media organizations. So then what's all the fuss about? The fuss about? Our fuss about uh, the, the unfree media, if uh, technology is spreading like, uh, like a fire and uh, everybody's getting access to the new media, why are we still concerned about uh, cross-ownership, the lack of diversity, control of the government, uh, technology creates new sets of challenges, but actually when it comes to freedom, access, technology helps. Technology does not help when it comes to uh, getting the depth of what we actually need, because it requires time, it requires commitment, and uh, the, the, the model of web-based newspapers or web-based media outlets is not always helpful. However, again, creativity, human mind, is able to find solutions. Crowdfunding, which has helped uh, new artists come to the cinema scene, music scene, is one of the uh, at least options that we have to consider, for example, to fund new investigative journalism. Online can help. So uh, many of the fears we have are 20th century fears. Good. Add something to that. You may, yes, sir. Uh, the, I think the, the level of penetration of different media is important, but it also varies with the level of literacy in a country. Uh, of, you know, for instance, in Pakistan, the level of internet penetration is hardly 12 or 13 percent. And, uh, you know, the, as compared with this uh, internet or the new social media, the level of uh, the penetration through television, both ter terrestrial and, and satellite, is, is quite huge, is, is about you know, 60 to 70 percent, uh, it's, it's reachable. And even the, the cable television is now fastly catching up. And people are more adaptable to the, uh, to the audiovisual news transmittal rather than either the press or the social media. Uh, so I think the, the, it is important to, to factor in this factor, uh, to factor in this point, level of education in a society as well. I want to now jump to the issue of regulation, and uh, we agree that an independent media are essential for a free media, and then diversity, uh, as long as diversity is there, uh, we are not so much concerned. Now, how do you safeguard uh, a diverse or pluralistic media? And, and we see that in the internet, in the World Wide Web, it's not that difficult through technological reasons. 
But in Germany, we have a very sophisticated system of anti-monopoly legislation, and there are watchdogs who are very, very uh, harsh uh, in, in, their, in their judgments in avoiding a monopoly. How is it in your countries? Can I have a very brief overview, maybe starting in the Philippines? Do you have watchdogs who prevent uh, the creation of monopolies and guarantee yeah. diversity? Uh, in the Philippines, there has been a pending bill which has not been passed. Uh, it's on antitrust. It's an antitrust bill, meaning it's a bill to prevent monopolies in various industries, including media. So that's something that we're watching for. We want to advocate that. The second, uh, we need may maybe more uh, active watchdogs of the media uh, who really are able to measure um, independence, because that's a difficult uh, thing to track. And the third is there's a debate going on in the Philippines now about whether to amend the constitution to allow foreign ownership of media. It's purely owned by uh, Filipinos and this restricts ownership and it becomes uh, uh, um, concentrated in the very, among the very rich. Eduardo, do you have uh, antitrust laws or no, stuff and, of this kind? Uh, and uh, because of the characteristic of the government we have right now, uh, the, the, the entity that's supposed to watch uh, for diversity, uh, especially on, on the telecommunication uh, sphere. Uh, as I said, the, the, the family of the president owns uh, a, lot of, a lot of TV stations, so it's not doing its job, or it's probably doing its job because it's keeping it. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I think um, that what uh, may help, uh, laws may help, but uh, if, if there is not a citizenry that is uh, active and they are uh, watching that these laws are being enforced, and if they're not being enforced, they are, they are you know, being vocal about it. If there is not uh, that citizenry very, very active, uh, the laws are not, uh, not going to help much. Because I, I, I can cite another law, it's uh, the, the Freedom of Information Law, as I said. Uh, the, it's there, it's a very good law in, on paper, but no, the government just decided not to follow it, not to, not to enforce it, and, and we don't have access to, to information. Oleg, do you have um, an antitrust or anti-monopoly yeah. uh, law? Yeah, anti-monopoly uh, legislation is expecting uh, to prevent the concentration of the media, but uh, uh, what Eduardo said, uh, the key word is the rule of law or enforcing of the law. Uh, through the uh, offshore companies, uh, same person yes. can have the ownership or control. It depends not only on the ownership, but on uh, who controls the media, where the decision is made. And uh, despite of the uh, good uh, written on the paper legislation, uh, there are problems with the concentration and uh, with the uh, monopolization of the market. Pakistan competition uh, legislation available and uh, implemented or? Yeah, the, the, there are two actually regimes to uh, sort of uh, regulate the media. One is the overall antitrust or the competition commission, which is fairly advanced in terms of the legal structure and very active also in Pakistan, fairly independent also. Uh, and then there is this uh, electronic media Re regulatory authority, which is specifically focused on the media regulation. So the structures are in place, but there are certain problems which, uh, for instance, the, the media regulatory authority uh, excludes the state-owned media channels from its uh, ambit. So it says that, okay, uh, this applies to only private sector media players, which actually, you know, jeopardizes the, the, the whole purpose of regulation because then you are not providing the level playing field. Um, then the, the appointment, I mean, that the structure of the entire regulatory authority, in my view, still, is still uh, to, be, to be debated because the chairman has to be appointed by the president of the country. And out of 12 members, for instance, half of the members have to be from the government. So when you, you don't have an independent regulatory authority, then the whole purpose of actually enforcing competition is, you know, becomes quite, quite questionable. So I think it is evolving, it is there, the structure is there, but they, I see a lot of uh, challenges in terms of um, the uh, enforcement of the rules because of the structure itself. I mean, very briefly regarding only Lebanon. And, uh, only Lebanon is the exact opposite. We have legally protected monopolies. 
legally protected monopolies, uh, I t told you about the licensing system and about how the government decided or the law decided that these are the channels that are allowed to uh, broadcast. So all the efforts now are just to open up the market and liberalize the market. Even the enforcement authority, the Audiovisual Council, has been appointed only once back in 1996 under Syrian influence, their term ended in 2005, Nobody, because for of political reasons, the, a new council was never appointed, and these people are still in place uh, uh, without any real legitimacy and contributing to the situation of uh, protected monopolies. We want to come to an end of our panel discussion here, and we want to ask the question whether there is a relationship between economic freedom on the one hand and, and media freedom on the other hand. Uh, and I would like to give uh, the floor first to our libertarian. I'm sure he has a very clear position on this. Uh, maybe you share this with, with us and then we, we, we hand on. Yeah, when I was, I would look at the, you know, uh, uh, and I would take the question mark in your theme as, you know, with a, with a serious note, because I see a positive relationship with, between uh, expanding economic freedom and uh, expanding media freedom. But um, this relationship may not hold true for if other conditions are absent. For instance, if we talk about uh, the protection of life uh, uh, or the rule of law. And even, you know, if, even you, if you have economic freedom, if you have economic freedom in terms of, ent you know, freedom to entry and exit of media, of media firms, and there is competition there, uh, the, the level of media freedom would be reduced, even in presence of economic freedom. So um, I think we have, you know, what I would say that economic freedom is a necessary, but not sufficient condition for media freedom. That's, that's, that's my understanding of how, you know, the various, these two factors have evolved in Pakistan. And, um, uh, but we were saying that uh, for a diverse uh, media, we need a competition, and a uh, competition economy is a free economy. Isn't this uh, like uh, a logical consequence then? Yeah, for instance, if you, if you look, look at the ratings of Pakistan uh, over a few years, on two indices. Uh, one is the press freedom index and one is the economic freedom index. Now, uh, you will see a relationship. Pakistan has deteriorated in both indices in the last five years. So you can say there's a positive relationship. But the point is that if you unpack this index and if you see that what is actually driving Pakistan deterioration on, for instance, press freedom index, despite of the, uh, despite of the healthy competition, is, I would say, the violence against journalism, is against, I would say, the, st the state otherwise suppression of the media freedom of expression. So the, the relationship is there, but it's, it's not very easily established. Eduardo, free economy, free press? Um, well, not necessarily, because you can look at Singapore where there's free economy, probably the freest economy in the world, and there's no free press. But, uh, uh, or China, where, which, which is getting uh, or Vietnam. Or Vietnam. But uh, um, I think it's, uh, I agree with Ali, it's uh, an essential part uh, because uh, free economy will give you a, a robust economy, a robust economy uh, will help uh, new, uh, newspapers and, and television stations because their main income is through uh, advertising. So uh, a free economy, a strong economy will give advertising to, this, uh, to the media and this will make them economically independent. And uh, we won't then have to worry even to, to go against one big company or one big uh, interest or one big uh, millionaire because, uh, and not be afraid that they're gonna, they're gonna take away uh, the advertising because there is enough to go around. So I think that's, that's important, but uh, it is also important the, the, the part about the rule of law uh, that's essential, uh, and, the, and the respect uh, of, of, of individual freedoms. And uh, uh, th I will say that, uh, that those, those two factors will be uh, very important, and they have to go together. You cannot have freedom of the press if you don't have both, uh, both things. Thank you. Uh, Oleg, please. The question yeah. is free uh, economy, free press. I would say that uh, free economy is crucial for the free, pre free press. It's, uh, it's almost impossible to do the uh, free and independent media in case government like in Azerbaijan or in Belarus is creating the list of the 
media that uh, the advertising would never come, no matter from state companies or from private business. But at the same time, this is not only a single uh, factor that affects the creation and development of free press. Uh, I think that uh, there are a lot of other factors that we have discussed here uh, that are affecting. But this is crucial point, one of the crucial points. Okay, Simon? Um, there are examples of countries that are not, um, that don't, that actually have a free economy but don't have freedom of the press. But I don't think there are many examples of, pe of countries with free press and without a free economy. However, when we talk about free economy, we don't have to have this small government fetish. Because if we look at the countries with the highest rankings in terms of press freedom, we'll mainly find Scandinavian and Nordic countries that have a huge government, and, but other factors that contribute to economic freedom. So if we look at Finland, Norway, and these countries. So we don't, if we're not ideological about uh, free economy, it works better. Because if free economy only means small government, uh, we won't necessarily l find a correlation between the two. A free economy means clear... You have to look into the direction of your libertarian neighbor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, but if we, a free economy means clear property rights, clear adjudication systems, dispute regulation systems, uh, uh, the ability of everybody to enter the market, free information, access to information, then of course these are essential but not sufficient ingredients of a free press. Great. Uh, we started this round uh, with our single lady here, and we will also conclude it with Marites, and then we will open the floor to you, ladies and gentlemen, Marites, okay. on this issue of free economy yes, and free... Yes, uh, I want to put in one major ingredient, which is equity. Because if we have free economies, but the, the divide between the rich and the poor is so vast, then that people will have no access to the media. So we need uh, equity, an equitable society, and then this will lead to a rising and a stronger middle class, and that for me will completely uh, make our, our media more free and our democracy uh, richer. Thank you very much, Marites Vito from the Philippines. Thank you also for uh, your contributions. Yes, very welcome. We now have uh, some 20 minutes, uh, and it's time for you to ask questions or make short comments. In the interest of all, please make short comments. We will collect your questions and then have rounds. Madam here. Maybe introduce yourself, and if you have a question directed at a certain individual, please indicate this. Good afternoon. My name is Annika Klasen. I work for ISEC Germany. And I would like to address the topic of ways how to safeguard free media and which role multinational institutions like the EU can play in it. Like, for instance, when you take into account what is happening in Hungary under Viktor Orban at the moment, what is your viewpoint, what, to what extent and in which way should and could the EU interfere there? A very important question, not only Hungary, but also some other countries which are misbehaving. Please, gentlemen. Um, hi, my name is Hamid Mossadegh. I'm from Iran, but, uh, Iranian background, but I, um, actually now I'm German. Um, I w I'm from the IMS program Deutsche Welle, so uh, I'm actually part of the, also one part of the Global Media Forum. And uh, my question is, uh, how strong do you need, do you think uh, freedom, of, uh, freedom for the press, we talk about it here from the professional perspective, and we are all, uh, I think we are all clear that we all want freedom of the press. But do you think that especially in developing countries, people or the society is ready to have freedom right now from one of the other moment? Don't you think that there is a kind of development, education, and some other things necessary to set up freedom for the press too? And uh, that's why do you need, like I agree with you and you said economic freedom means also education and so on. So this is the question. And maybe a second question, how strong do you think is the, especially to Lebanon, um, how strong do you think is the influence of Iran on the Lebanon media system? Thank you. Madame Rana, please. I have a few comments. Um, the first thing is, um, I wouldn't call it um, an Arab uh, spring, I would probably call it an Arab um, awakening. We all remember that revolutions sometimes take 80 years and you know, if we have pitfalls, we will also have um, 
we will have the situation going up. Um, I'd like to say that, unfortunately, in all countries that have undergone change of regime, we have, had, we have seen a backlash against press freedom. I'll talk specifically about Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, the first thing President Morsi did was change the chief editors of 51 state-run newspapers. Uh, the first thing the Nahda government in Tunis did was replace the heads of the largest state-run media with people that were either from the Ancien regime, and in that way they could co-opt them, or, you know, with their own supporters. I mean, I have no problem in an Islamist running an institution of media, you know, if, if he is a competent, competent person, not if he's a politician trying to lead the whole society into that direction of political thinking. Um, the press freedom indexes in all Arab countries have gone down over the last three years. Uh, we also have a big problem with the conservative societies and the lack of education and critical thinking. And this is something that is not practiced and will not be practiced in a long time. We have a problem with journalists themselves lacking the skills and lacking the guts to be public servants. They would rather become uh, you know, cronies of systems and they all want to become ambassadors and ministers. And that's why you know, they're just in bed with, with the authorities. We talk about access to information. Uh, Jordan, where I come from, is a country that was the first to have access to information. And it was only because the EU put this as a condition. It was not a demand of the society or the citizenry. And until today, this law does not, you know, it just makes it difficult for everybody who wants to get information. Tunis, nothing has happened. They've had the second law. Yemen, nothing is happening. So, you know, it's just talk, talk, talk. And unfortunately, the West is more preoccupied with, with their strategic interests than with opening their mouths and really pointing out the truth that it's just window dressing that suits everybody. And um, the, la the last thing uh, I would like to talk about is, of course, you know, for the past 15 years, the debate in the Arab world has been, should economic reform proceed, political reform, or should it be in parallel? And I think it should be in parallel because both empower each other. And definitely, as my colleague said, it doesn't mean that if you have a free economy, you will have free, free media, but vice versa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we, we should acknowledge Mrs. Uh, Rana Sabarsh, who is the uh, executive director of the Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism. Thank you very much, Madam, for this comment. And now we move on. Yes, the gentleman, please. Hi, I just wanted to ask uh, two questions. Um, Can one you of them, identify yourself? Um, Nuruddin Abdi, future journalist. Maybe, maybe not. Do you have a nationality? or um, Somali born British. Um, so one of the two questions I wanted to ask was, um, obviously the majority of the people in your panel are from the developing uh, countries. Uh, how much is the influence of the developed countries, that how they, the media systems work in the developed countries, uh, influence the developing countries? And what critiques they have of the developing co developed countries? I also wanted to ask Aman um, about the reasons that, that he was pointing out about the, the that, that there's something called www. saying that uh, there are countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, um, uh, Dubai who are basically censoring the internet. So how can uh, future journalists get, a, get be, manage to get a platform? And is this kind of thing that's moving into maybe to Egypt or Tunisia? Okay. One more, we have one more, lady uh, to the left. Okay, two more, and then we will have to wrap it up because we have a big event happening later on. Madam. Okay, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Bushra Jamil Al Amin. I am the director of Al Mahabba radio station in Baghdad, Iraq, and it's a community independent women radio station. We've been on uh, working for the last eight years. Um, and I'm here, um, first of all, to just remind everybody that Iraq is still exists. It's really sad in me that um, every country, Arab country, get to be mentioned except for Iraq, while we, uh, the changes started with us. Uh, now, uh, of course, in, uh, on the subject of uh, media and media value, 
from my own uh, experience. Uh, we participated in the demonstration 2011. We got stabbed and attacked by uh, the government uh, thugs. Uh, we lost one of our uh, employees. Some were, uh, ended up in the detention center, tortured, beaten. Um, and then after that, uh, we had a campaign about uh, asking the government to fulfill their uh, promises. And we ended up uh, with a burned uh, station. They burned our station. Um, and now I'm saying, uh, or my question is, uh, how can we um, sustain media values? I mean, if we want media to be um, sincere, be truthful, when a country has demolished values, when the whole country is uh, uh, controlled by religious and political mafia, shouldn't be there an international body that would protect and guarantee the safety of media workers anywhere in the world? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, that is a very clear question. And the gentleman, very short, please, because we have to come to an end, please. Please be very short. Hi, um, Mark Liam, University of Hamburg. Uh, yesterday we had Noam Chomsky here, and um, he brought out a book in the 1980s called Manufacturing Consent with Edward um, Herman. I'm not sure how many of you have read it, but um, when you talk about freedom here, it seems to me you're talking about the freedom of concentrated capital, uh, because without that, it seems to be pretty difficult to set up a private uh, media company, whether it's a newspaper or, or a TV station or whatever. Um, in the book, I'll be brief. In the book... No, please, be very brief, not brief. Yeah. And there's okay. a lady who I will not acknowledge because we have to be out here by 10 minutes and everybody's last to answer. So please, sir, come yeah. to an end. Yeah, okay. Um, in the book, they describe the, the, the business of uh, private media, the business model as uh, the, the, the media companies selling readers to advertisers. Uh, would you... They were talking about the U.S. media. Does this also apply in uh, in your country? Thank you very much. So every one of you has two minutes, uh, and who will we start with? Mr. Ali, please. Try to answer also the questions. I will pick them up also in the end, but please. Yeah, I think I'll be uh, you know picking a few th threads on the questions. First of all, I think we have to acknowledge that in developing countries, state is already captured by the private interests. So if you let the state to control and if you don't let the private sector to come in, you are at actually into bigger trouble. So actually, I would pick the trouble of the private sector domination of the media rather than giving it to the state. Um, so that's the you know, broader theme. The, there are a couple of questions on the global governance issues. And you know, as a libertarian, I'm not in favor of global governance and because each country, each nation has its own peculiar you know, circumstances. And you cannot just transfer the liabilities, whether they are social, historical, or economic liabilities of one nation to another nation. That's a, that's a big uh, question mark from, from my point of view. Uh, there was a question on the, uh, uh, from you know, our Iranian German friend on the, you know, which freedoms and whether we can be you know, selective about freedoms. I think we cannot be, because uh, to, to me, the freedom of expression is you know, part of the basic fundamental rights. And you cannot pick and choose which rights to be given to the human beings at which state, uh, because they, these are sort of inalienable rights which are, which are there. And we must acknowledge them, and the freedom of expression comes with the freedom to earn your decent living accordingly. Thank you. We will hand on to Mr. Ayman. Please, I'll be just as brief. Role of the EU. The role of the EU is, first, uh, continuing to support SKIES. Uh, our foundation, but I mean uh, continuing to support press freedom organizations and also putting strict conditions on their support programs for police forces and for judiciary in developing countries really related to how they deal with freedom of expression issues. Um, people ready for freedom, I'll uh, quote Amartya Sen, countries do not become fit for democracy but through democracy. Influence of Iran. Um, actually, the influence of Iran is indirect. There is no direct Iranian influence on the media sector, much more related to the links between Iran and Hezbollah and the funding of some specific media outlets. But it's one influence out of many. Um, conservative societies, the only recipe 
I would think of right now would be to continue to shock them, continue the shock therapy, rocking the boat. We did it yesterday, but we can do it also there. Influence of developed countries, we mainly feel it in the media through importing uh, entertainment, um, uh, com uh, entertainment shows, and in a way, this is leading to some kind of change. One of the most ridiculous shows right now on Lebanese TV is also very political. It's Splash, celebrities, almost naked, jumping in the water. It's nothing in terms of political ideas and values, but it's very important to have half-naked bodies jumping in the water on prime time in, in the Arab world. KSA, Qatar, Dubai, censoring the internet. Yes, but let's continue to shock them. Whenever there are cases of people prevented from talking about a huge fire blaze where people killed because it, ha it happened in Qatar. It can't happen on Al Jazeera, but it will happen on another me uh, channel. It's the role of the bloggers to shed light on it. They can block Twitter, they can try to block Twitter, but when something is worldwide trending everywhere, it's much harder. This is why the danger here is related to the strategic interest that many Western countries and Western companies have with these places. But this is the role of the internet and free thinkers. And about concentration of capital. Yes, it exists, but at the same time, uh, adding to what my colleague Ali said, there is also opportunity with community-based initiatives on the internet, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing. These things are contributing to a new form of media. We don't necessarily know where it will go, but at least it's creating new paradigms that are worth pursuing. Thank you. Amen. No, we will have no time for discussion now. Bahrain, we, Bahrain also, I would like to be mentioned. No, Bahrain. yes, She's we a great can. Journalist. Yes, I'm very sorry, madam. I. Censoring chip in the internet. Rana Sabak, my colleague from Jordan, Ayman from Lebanon. Uh, we witnessed since uh, 2011 too many of harassment, uh, fabricated cases against journalists. Freedom of expression, freedom of press under a threat in Bahrain. We have a photojournalist until now uh, facing a trial for something. Can you imagine? A photojournalist is charged for burning a police station. His name is Ahmed Hamedan, and his name was reported by RSF and CPJ. We have also citizen journalist Ahmed Ismail was killed by live ammunition last year, and he was awarded and his picture and everything in DC right now that he was one of these young Bahrainis who went trying to pass the fact that what's happening in this small island in the Arab world. I mean, you did mention about Saudi Arabia, you mentioned about UAE, you mentioned about Qatar, and but Bahrain. you did not mention Bahrain. We still Khalifa, have, one of yes. the we heroes still of free press right. in Bahrain. A female Bahrain. journalist Please. who is Madam. facing, who is facing a trial, and she was tortured, uh, and still now, and this is from a very conservative region, and I really wanted to mention this because you mentioned most of, of the Arab countries, except this small island, the forgotten island, and the forgetting uprising, uh, uprising in, 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 in the region. I appreciate this, but please respect also, there are certain connationalities here. We didn't talk a word about what is happening in Turkey. We didn't talk about the misery of some of the media in Western Europe, which are suffering under a heavy economic crisis. We have not the ambition here to cover the whole world. Thank you for your contribution, and we will go on now. We have the chance later on to discuss with the gentleman and the lady here, but we have to come to an end. Please, Mr. Olive. Yeah, I'll try to be short, and uh, uh, Stanislav Jezlec, that was the Polish writer, someone uh, sometimes uh, told that, what is the freedom for the slave? To have a market where uh, he or she would choose the master. That's, that's the problem for the uh, emerging societies. And uh, that's why probably the freedom of press index uh, going down after the appraisal or after the changing of the uh, government. And uh, it takes time to uh, create a demand for a free press in the society that just uh, uh, changed, uh, started to, be, uh, to do changes. And uh, I would say that uh, a crucial uh, point is uh, development of the media literacy of the people, of the audience. Uh, that will help uh, uh, the people to understand the value of the pre -pre free press and the value of the, uh, in, of the professional and uh, important uh, for the society information. Thank you. Eduardo. Please uh, be brief and to the point. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I'm going to start with the part of the question about the edu education, because I think education is fundamental, but it's not 
must not be a precondition to freedom of the press or freedom of expression. I think that uh, freedom of the press and freedom of expression, uh, it's also uh, does its part for uh, to educating uh, the people. So uh, I wouldn't put it as a precondition. Uh, the influence of developing of developed countries, I I, I understand it, it has uh, uh, bad influences, but they also have good influences. Uh, you know, the good press in, in the developed countries, with the developing countries, we have taken them as an example, and we're trying uh, to do to do as well or better than 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 the good press in the developed countries. So it's it's also a good influence. Um, uh, the more, how can we? Uh, sustain values in a country where their moral values have been demolished. Well, that's part of the free press. That's part of the function of the free press. We have to keep reminding people that there are values, and we have to keep reminding ourselves that there are values. We have to hold ourselves to a code of ethics uh, and, 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 and obey it and, and try to give the best journalism uh, we can. And uh, concentration of capital, yes, there, there is, there's always going to be big media. And that's, that's a way of putting it, selling readers to advertisers, but uh, uh, that's just a fact of life. If there, is, if there is no advertising, there is no good, there is no good press. But there is also in is, uh, small initiatives, community initiatives, and it's a uh, 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 democratization of the, pre of, the, of the media now with the internet. So I wouldn't worry too much uh, about that. So, that will be uh, Marites, a short word, because I've been given a signal by yes. the organizers yeah, that we just, come to an end. Just one, um, I will reply to the question on how EU can safeguard the free media, is to support the conditions that lead to independent and free media. How? They've been doing this in the Philippines. They've been training our prosecutors so they can investigate killings of journalists. Number two is to help a judiciary by making the system faster, declogging the dockets. But I'd like to suggest that they should provide access to credit for media startups, media diversity, and also su uh, support uh, watchdogs and independent media. Thank you very much. I have two sentences to add. First of all, I would like to thank all of you once, but I would say as a, as a conclusion, take the time and look into these international indices. And there you will see that uh, countries uh, which are unfree economically tend to be also unfree regarding their media. So there seems to be some sort of a correlation. We've seen that it's not that simple, yeah. but there is a correlation. And my last remark regarding what the EU should do if governments are fooling around with the media, the EU is a, is a, is a community, a federation, as we were told yesterday, of countries, governments with a certain value base, and amongst them is democracy, liberal democracy, and press freedom belongs to it. And I think it's a part of the deal that if you deal with the European Union, the European Union should attach a certain uh, conditionality and pressurize these governments. Uh, how they do it uh, is up to the politicians, but I think uh, the Europeans should stick to a certain standard there. I would like to thank all of you. Excuse me for being brief now, and excuse me for being a little impatient also, but uh, you will see that big things are happening and will happen at this very space. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I wish you a very pleasant evening and the rest of your stay here in Bonn. Thank you very much.